depths of my soul I cry out. In the midst of the sea I cry out. In the midst of the sea I cry out.
Good morning. Welcome to our services on Resurrection Sunday. It's a beautiful day in Granbury, Texas. We had a nice gentle rain right before the sun came up this morning, and now uh, it's just absolutely beautiful outside. So welcome. We may not be physically present, but we are definitely together in spirit, and I have quite the array of imaginary friends with me here this morning, and they all amen my sermons on a very regular basis. I have grown to appreciate that. Let me uh, update you on some pertinent announcements this morning. First of all, cancellations are church services in person along with our Bible classes in person, office services and other activities with the exception of the food pantry at the Christian Service Center are all canceled until further notice. We will continue to stream Sunday morning services and in addition the children's and youth ministries are also offering online activities. Let me also give you some updates on communion and contributions. In compliance with the recent shelter-in-place order issued in Hood County, the church office is now closed. If you need portable communion supplies, if you'll contact Mark Hackney, his cell number is on the screen. You can request that those supplies be dropped off at your door. During this time, we're also asking you to continue your contributions by giving on the secure online site listed there on the screen, or you can mail your contributions uh, to the church office. I want to thank everybody for your ongoing financial commitment. We have a lot of uh, investment in our community as far as needs being fulfilled, and I think that will be even pronounced, uh, more pronounced in the coming weeks. Let me also give you just an update on the food pantry. You saw the totals on the screen as we began this morning. We served over 200 people this past week. If you'd like to donate items to the food pantry, you can drop them off at the Christian Service Center and just place them right inside the entryway. That door will remain unlocked. And also, volunteers under the age of 60 are needed to distribute food at the pantry from 1 o'clock to 3 o'clock on Mondays and Wednesdays. So this spring, this is actually our fifth week, we've been spending some time digging into the scriptures that enhance our understanding and appreciation for the Holy Spirit. Last week, one of the observations that I made in my sermon is this. When our minds are set on the things of the Spirit, He works in ways that are hard to explain. When our minds are set on the things of the Spirit, as Paul says in Romans chapter 8, verse 5, He works in ways that are really hard for us to explain. One of the things I try to do every morning when I get up and begin my day is to express what I refer to as the prayer of opportunity. Basically, what that prayer entails is asking God to present opportunities that particular day to serve people, to lead me to that individual or to lead me to that group of people whom I hope that I can be a blessing to that particular day. The prayer of opportunity, just pray that he will work through me. I think God honors those prayers, and I think as the Spirit orchestrates the events of our lives and those situations or those opportunities to serve people that we can't possibly explain, we can't possibly refer to them simply as coincidence, they just happen as the Spirit works in our lives. But additionally, I noted two weeks ago that sometimes we don't know what to pray, or sometimes we really don't know how to pray. And we're reminded of this promise in Romans chapter 8, 26 and 27. Paul says in the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes with groans that words cannot express. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with God's will. 
Now, here's where it gets interesting. That thought, that thought regarding the intercessory role of the Holy Spirit is followed by a passage we're perhaps a little more familiar with, and that's Romans chapter 8, verse 28, the very next verse. And we know that in all things, God works for the good <clears throat> of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Sometimes we take that passage all by itself, Romans 8, 28, we take it all by itself, and lift it out of its context and quote it all by itself. And really the original intent was it's part of that thought that actually begins in verse 26 that the Spirit helps us in our weakness and the Spirit expresses with groans that words cannot express how we can fulfill God's will in our life. And then that's followed by the thought in Romans 8 verse 28 that God is working in our lives to accomplish his purpose, not necessarily our purpose, but rather his purpose, his divine will. So those thoughts in mind, those thoughts from Romans 8, 26 through 28, with those thoughts in mind, I'm going to have what I'm going to refer to this morning as a Romans 8, 28 story for you. And I think that's going to be especially encouraging, especially in light of present circumstances, a Romans 8, 28 story. Last fall, a young woman and her son came to the U.S. from Venezuela. They actually came to Granbury. Her son began school at GMS, and of course, English is a second language for him. You can imagine being in middle school and navigating all the complexities of middle school, and English is not even your first language. Try to put yourself in their shoes this morning. Try to imagine being in a new country with a new language and a different culture and trying to work through all the challenges that present themselves. It's, it's overwhelming. If we can genuinely empathize with their plight, it's overwhelming. So where does a person turn? Where does a person turn when they're in such overwhelming circumstances? Well, here's what actually occurred. Her son pointed to a building. And he said, Mom, go to that building. They'll help you. He pointed to this building. He pointed to this red brick building that was built in 1972 at 1905 West Pearl. He pointed to our building. In October the 15th of last year, she just came in our office one afternoon and she met Artina, Tina Reynolds. We call her Artina. Now, Tina brings a lot of gifts to the table. We have her up front as receptionist for a good reason. One of the reasons is, is that she keeps all of us on the straight and narrow path. If I walk in the door and have the least little bit of a grumpy appearance on my face, Tina will look me straight in the eye and say, you can just put on your happy pants and get over it. That's one of the roles that our Tina fulfills, but she does a lot of other things really well too. And at the very top of that very list is her ability to welcome people that God puts on our doorstep. And I am firmly convinced that God puts people on our doorstep on a very regular basis because it actually happens. It happens over and over and over again. I'm convinced God put this young woman on our doorstep for a reason. And it further confirms that the Spirit works in ways that are very difficult for us to explain or to put in words. Now, on this particular day that this young woman showed up, I was out of town. So Tina took very detailed notes. She was very kind. She was very welcoming. It goes beyond just being friendly. She was very welcoming and very helpful. 
and I still have those notes that are dated from October of last year. These are Tina's detailed handwritten notes that I received the next day when I got back in to the office. I called this woman. I set up a time for her to come in the office, and we visited more extensively the very next day. And in the weeks and months that followed that eventful week, many of you have gotten acquainted with Sonia Martinez and her son, Enyo. Billy Martin has been privileged to serve as Enyo's mentor at GMS. Enyo's English skills have improved substantially. I'm not sure that Billy's Spanish skills have, in, have improved at the same level, but that's another discussion for another day. This morning, our shepherd, Billy Martin, is going to immerse Sonia into Christ, and then he is going to immerse Enyo into Christ as well. In fact, he is going to do it right now. You'll get to see it better online than some of you who sit on the third row from the back. I'll choose not to name names, but I know some of you who sit on the third row from the back. Praise be to God who works for the good for those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Let's pray as we anticipate her confession of faith in Jesus Christ and their immersion into Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we're grateful that through your spirit, you put people on our doorstep. We know that's from you and praise be to you that you allow us to share the gospel. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Sonia, there are millions of Christians all over the world today celebrating the fact that Jesus is risen. So I just am so excited that you have decided to accept Jesus into your life. When Jesus walked on this first face of this earth years ago, he had a conversation with a man named Nicodemus. He told Nicodemus, one cannot enter the kingdom of God unless he is born again. Nicodemus said, how can that be? How, how can an old man go back into the mother's womb? And Jesus said, you must be born of the water and the spirit. So this morning you will experience a, experience a, a spiritual rebirth. And when you come up out of this water of baptism, you'll begin your spiritual journey with Christ. But the good news is, you will not be on that journey by yourself. Millions of other Christians are taking that same journey. So I'm going to ask you one question this morning before I baptize you. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? I know you do. Yes, I do. Oh, yes. Yes, all right, I all right, do. <laughs> all right, all right. And I am so proud of him. He told his mother he wanted to come to America so he could study to be an engineer. He is a straight A student. And he decided he wanted to be baptized. So Enyo, I couldn't be any prouder of you. So I want to ask you the same question I'd ask your mom. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Yes. I know you do. So I will now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit for the remission of your sins. And the church said, Amen. Jeff Jeffries, who serves as one of our elders, is going to share some thoughts from the elders. morning aren't we blessed to to witness uh, this event on the same occasion that our Savior uh, rose uh, after his his crucifixion 
I wanted to Think, think th for us to think about faith and hope and how tightly they're knitted in Scripture. The book of Hebrews tells us faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. The dictionary says faith is confidence or trust in a person or thing or a belief not based on proof. Hope is an optimistic attitude of an expert expectation or desire. Faith is now. Hope says in the future it could happen. As Christians, we have faith that during difficult times that God will overcome whatever circumstances we may arise. We hope his response to our request is sooner than later. Faith brings all the benefits of salvation. Ephesians 2 tells us this includes healing, peace, love, and joy. Faith, then, is just as important as the air we breathe. While the oxygen in the air nourishes our body, faith nourishes the heart and soul. It is the energy that courses through every single fiber and cell within us. We as Christians believe our faith is based on the supernatural, miraculous events that have taken place in history. This weekend, we celebrate one such event in the death and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As we study the scriptures and believe what, we, what they teach us, let us also have confidence that we are not alone in this current circumstance that we are experiencing. The writer of Psalms said, <clears throat> I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I hope. He also says, my soul longs for your salvation. I hope in your word. And then he says, for you are my hope, O Lord, my confidence from my youth. Will you pray with me? Our Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity we have to see another sunrise. We are blessed by the knowledge that your son was risen, and someday we will rise in the same manner. We ask that you go with us, be with us, <clears throat> protect us, and guide us. Um, give our, our leaders confidence and courage to get us through this current circumstance. It's through faith in you and the hope that we have that uh, this will be a speedy recovery, and the, the, the seriousness that we've experienced so far will, will uh, rapidly come to a close. It's through your son that we pray. Amen. While we are still sinners... In Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 8, Paul says, You see, at just the right time while we were still sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still sinners. I think sometimes there's this false thinking, this false thought that I cannot possibly be a follower of Jesus until I get my life in order first. I don't know where that false thinking comes from, but it's, a, it's definitely incorrect, this idea. Well, I, once I get my act together, once I get my life in order, then I can be a follower of Jesus. Here's the truth. The truth is he gave himself for us when we were still a big mess. God really, really loves us. 
So this morning as we participate in the Lord's Supper and break bread together, we are remembering that Jesus gave himself. He gave his body for us. And he definitely intended this meal to be a time for us to bring that to mind. So as we break this bread together, let us give thanks because he gave himself for all of us when we we're still a big, huge mess while we were still sinners. Let's pray. Father, thank you for allowing us to participate in this meal and to do so together. Thank you that while we were still sinners, a big old mess, that Jesus gave himself for each of us. And we pray in his very name. Amen. united with him in his resurrection. One of the things that Paul does throughout the book of Romans is to pose ongoing rhetorical questions. 
And so in the chapter, after chapter 5, where he has expressed that even while we were still sinners, Christ died for us, he poses this rhetorical question in Romans 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means we died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us, who were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death. We were, therefore, buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead to the glory of the Father, we, too, may live a new life. If we have been united with him like this in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. We have been united with him in his resurrection. So that rhetorical question, should we go on sinning? Of course not. As we ponder the very idea that Christ died for us while we were still sinners, is that our response that we're going to go on sinning? I don't think so. You responded in trusting faith. You have a new life like Sonia and Inyo. You have a new life. You or going to be united with him in his resurrection. Now here's some interesting perspective, especially on Resurrection Sunday. Here's some interesting perspective. When the women showed up at the tomb on that Sunday morning where Jesus was buried and found it to be empty, they had no idea of the events that were about to be set in motion following that discovery. I had this image, I was reading from Luke's gospel this morning of Mary Magdalene, someone who had been struggled with evil spirits once upon a time before she encountered Jesus, and she was there at the tomb that morning. They had no idea everything that was about to unfold. For example... The same Paul who said that while we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. The same Paul who says that if you've been united with him like this in his death, we'll certainly be united with him in his resurrection. That same Paul, that same Paul who in the early days following the resurrection of Jesus was actively persecuting Christians. But then there was another fateful day and Jesus actually appeared to him as he was walking down the road to Damascus. Paul was an eyewitness of Jesus' resurrection. As he refers and reflects on later, he said, I was one who was abnormally born. He had a very unique experience And a man named Ananias had the privilege of immersing Paul into Jesus Christ. So as we think about the role of Jesus' resurrection and how we identify with it, I, I would ask you this morning to express that prayer of opportunity in a very specific way. To pray for that person whom God will bring to you that person like Paul who perhaps is very misguided, that person who desperately needs to have a relationship with Jesus. So we're going to drink the fruit of the vine together, and as we do so, we are reminded that not only have we been buried with him in his death, but we have been raised and share in his resurrection. We have been raised to live a new life in him. Let's Reflect on that very thought as we pray and appreciate the fruit of the vine this morning.
Father, we're very aware that Jesus shed his blood for us. And as we participate in this fruit of the vine, we are so thankful that we too have been raised to live a new life. Thank you for allowing us to share in his resurrection in such a manner as we pray in his name. Amen. You called me from the grave by name. You called me out of all my shame. I see the old has passed away. time in our service we would normally have a contribution so I think it's a fitting time to express one more time how much we appreciate your commitment to the financial needs of the church and as we are working in the kingdom of God we're just very gracious and very appreciative for your generosity I have found over these last several weeks since we have uh, been worshiping in this setting that my imaginary friends are not generous at all so uh, we're grateful that you are I think that some of them probably need to baptize their billfolds there is a thought that's expressed in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 15. He died for everyone so that those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they'll live for Christ who died and was raised for them. And so even in your generosity, you are living that new life. You are living for him who was raised for us. And again, we just want to say thank you one more time. Let's, let's pray and give thanks for those, especially who have been generous. And then we'll have some sermon time this morning. Father, so grateful for the generosity of so many people that enables us to fulfill your will and specifically to help people, to serve people, and to reach out to people who are in our community and also to continue to partner with our missionaries across the globe and to help them fulfill your will too. We're so thankful and we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. If you say that a, another person is 
controlling, that is generally not stated as a compliment. If you refer to somebody as being controlling, you do not intend that as a compliment. You might even say something to the effect, he is trying to control me or she is trying to control me and I am having none of that. I suspect somebody said that this past week. He's trying to control me or she's trying to control me and I'm going to have none of that. Now, completely on the other side of the spectrum, most of us really like the idea of being in control. In other words, we are steering the ship of life ourselves. Actually, the scripture uses the term control. But the scripture uses the term control in an, an entirely different way. But nevertheless, when the scripture says control, it means control exactly as you would think of that term. In Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 9, and that's where I left off last week as we looked at Romans chapter 8 last week, specifically in regard to how the Spirit is active in our lives. We looked at Romans 8, 1 through 8. I'm going to pick up in verse 9, specifically verses 9 through 11 this morning. And take note, especially as I read this passage, of the prominence of the term control and how it's used. He says, you, however, are not controlled by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit. If the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, your body is dead because of sin, yet your spirit is alive because of righteousness. Then verse 11. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who lives in you. So you are being controlled after all. The spirit is controlling you and Praise be to God. Praise be to God that the Spirit is controlling you. If the Spirit lives in you, the sinful nature, or some of the translations will say the flesh, ceases to control your life. And I'm quite certain that we all know people who do not belong to Jesus. We have probably close friends and family members who do not belong to Jesus. And we are fully aware that their selfish desires, the sinful nature, the flesh, really do control them, control their very life. And it's heartbreaking because these are people we love and care about. So it breaks our hearts as we see them being controlled by the sinful nature. But thankfully, that's not where you find yourself today. I'm going to sidetrack for just a moment. And for those of you who are streaming with us that aren't accustomed to hearing me preach, those who are here at the Granbury Church of Christ on a regular basis know that I'm inclined to sidetrack from time to time, but I always come back to sinners. So let's sidetrack just for a moment. We are living in an unprecedented time in this country right now. It is a time characterized by uncertainty. It is certainly a time when anxiety really is pronounced. The term edgy is also fitting. Are you a little edgy? I find that I am a little edgy, a little on edge. In our family, it's been a time of role reversal. 
I've been getting texts from our oldest son about every other day, checking on us, making sure that we're doing what we're supposed to be doing, making sure that we're doing the social distancing and quarantine. I mean, he's talking to us like the roles are reversed. And I thought, oh, that's a first. This really is an interesting and extraordinary time. And it's also a time when all of us realize there are a lot of things, there are so many things that we have no control over at all. That's my sidetrack because that's where we find ourselves at this very moment. So on this Resurrection Sunday, a clear message of hope. And it's not a message of hope that things will get better in the short term. I don't know that they are. It's a message of hope that has far more depth in meaning. So back to Romans chapter 8, specifically the first half of verse 11. Romans 8, 11, the first half. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, who's living in you? Who is in your heart at this very moment? The spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you. I have no doubt at all that I have, found, I have sounded very repetitive over the last five Sundays because I have stressed for five weeks now the importance of acknowledging the very presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. So let me say it one more time, and I promise to hush. I won't say it next week. This will be the last time, I think. The Holy Spirit is living in you. Now you know why. Now you know why I've stressed that fact for five weeks. I was building up to today. Building up to convey this truth in Romans 8 verse 11. The spirit of him who raised Jesus is living in you. I'm so thankful he is in control and I am not. He is powerful and I am not. He is wise and I am not. He will lead. He will guide he will comfort and he will intercede with groans that words could not possibly express. There is also the second half of verse 11. The second half, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who lives in you. He gives us hope. He will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who lives in you. Let's just do a real quick reminder, a reality check this morning. A quick reality check. Our hope is in him. Our hope is not in the American economy. The 24-7 news that's invading your living room every day or invading your computer does not determine our hope. Some of you who have been around a while have heard the phrase, he stopped preaching and started meddling. Y'all know that phrase? He stopped preaching and started meddling. I'm going to start meddling for just a minute. I have a response to the 24-7 news that's invading your living room on your television or invading your computer screen. Turn it off. Turn it off. Shut it down. 
our hope is not rooted in what you're hearing on 24-7 news. Our hope is rooted in him. He gives us life through his spirit. He raised Jesus from the dead, and he will raise you too. Turn it off. Open your Bibles and reflect on the hope that we have in Jesus. So the sidetrack's over, and so is the Medlin. I'm back to preaching now. He will raise you too. I have homework for us this morning. It's difficult to offer an invitation in such a setting as this, but I have been offering homework. Isn't that a great way to put it? Offering homework? I'm offering homework. One of my very favorite songs that we sing is the song, Lord, Take Control. There are various arrangements on it on YouTube. If you want to listen to it on YouTube, there are various arrangements and various styles of it being presented. You can also look up the lyrics. And the chorus goes as follows on Lord Take Control. My heart, my mind, my body, my soul, I give to you. Take control. I give my body as a living sacrifice. Lord, take control. Take control. As we're reminded that we don't want to be controlled by others. And furthermore, we're reminded as well that we tend to want to take control ourselves. The Spirit is actually controlling our very lives as we looked at in Romans 8, verse 9. You, however, are not controlled by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit, if the Spirit of God lives in you. So homework for this week is reflect on these lyrics. Listen to the song on YouTube and pray with the song. My heart, my mind, my body, my soul, I give to you. Take control. I give my body a living sacrifice. Lord, take control. Take control. Let us pray. Father, we are thankful that the Spirit is controlling our very lives. Our prayer this morning is that we give you our heart, our mind, our body, our soul. Lord, take control as we pray in the name of Jesus.